Our topic today is on um, school induced trauma. And um, if Sai is here, I want him to just do the introduction. Has anyone seen Sai streaming? Did anyone let in Sai? I don't know if I let him in, but I can see we are streaming live on Facebook. So somebody is streaming live on Facebook. That, that's, that's, that, I will, that was that's you. Me. Yeah, that's me. Okay. I have powers to stream live on, on Facebook. So okay. um, yeah, let me see where he is. All right. But is, is Saya on the call? I can't see you. And I, I, because many people are letting other people. Saya, are you there on the call? Doesn't seem to be in the arm. Um... I don't think he's here yet. Okay. He'll do his spiel later, but let's, let's just start with um, uh, definitions. And this will go to the, to the therapist team and that's Mukimba and uh, Joanne. Um, I just want us to have a definition of what school-induced trauma is. Uh, Mukimba will start with you and then go to Joanne. Uh, thanks, yeah. So I think it will be easier to start with what trauma is, yeah? Trauma is a set of circumstances or events that happen to a person because we're talking about brain, we're talking about mental trauma, right? So it's a set of circumstances, depending on your analysis. I feel like we can't just limit it to a specific set of circumstances because then people's translation of one plus other mitigating factors makes a whole difference. So it's a set of circumstances and experiences that cause a certain form of injury, right? And so school-induced trauma is some now those sets of circumstances limited to the environment of schools. And when we think of, you know, our system in the Kenyan system, I'm thinking of boarding schools, I'm thinking of high schools and bullying and, you know, invalidation by teachers and, you know, extreme behaviors that happen. And yeah, so basically school-induced traumas are those experiences and events that happen while we are in the institutions of higher learning, yeah? So I, I, I'm hoping that is a bit clear. <laughs> Joanne, help me out. Okay, hey guys, my name is Joanne Mwangi. And I'm going to clarify, I'm not a therapist. I'm a life coach and there's a huge difference between the two. Uh, I do, however, coach adults um, to work on, to identify and heal their traumas in conjunction with therapy. So for me, I, I look at trauma in a very simplistic manner because uh, when we use long terms and large terms and long words, it makes it very complicated. So for me, the way I describe trauma to my students, it is what happens in you, your, your, the way your body and your mind and your spirit reacts to an event that would be considered traumatic. And there are many different, of tr different types of trauma. A lot of the traumas we see in a school environment in an educational system are largely what we call microaggressions. And that is many little things happening concurrently that cause uh, a, a, your system to react a certain way, your nervous system to react a certain way. So it could be bullying from uh, your peers or your child's peers. It could be bullying from the teachers. It could be um, just fear, uh, a, a fear induced by the educational system. It could be um, big things like being uh, beaten, or we call it beaten in Kenya, or being whooped in Kenya, right? It could be being denied uh, food in boarding schools as means of punishment. It could be whatever means of punishment that is uh, instilled in children. So it could be a variety of things, but it is how your body and your nervous system reacts to those events as they happen. So that is what we call, I call trauma in my environment. I hope that makes sense. Back I to you, Posa. Yeah, I think it's clear, but I just want um, us to differentiate the difference between trauma and abuse. 
Like, is it are they synonymous or what? What? What one? What's the other? One is so for me, the other. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Patricia. So basically, abuse comes before the trauma. So you're abused, and it leads to trauma. The abuse causes you to be traumatized, and then in that event, then now you know you're a victim of the trauma caused by the abuse. Does that make sense, Posa? Yes, it does. Um, and if I can piggyback on that, I would like to say because in 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 the different parts of the world, we use the word the word abuse differently. So in this case, we are what we, we when we say abuse, it is everything. It is insults in Kenya. We call it abuse. At insulting somebody, we call it abusing somebody. I was abused by a person, right? Or bodily harm that is also abuse and then there's also emotional abuse which is things like silent treatment whereby you're being ignored you know there's something wrong but the person is not explaining what is wrong they're just acting like you don't exist that is a form of abuse so just wanted to add that on okay uh, yes. yeah let, let me just add a little bit of an element just the middle between Trish and Joan is okay. the mitigating factors is what differentiates how I could analyze something as a traumatic event. It could be an abusive event, yeah? But something in the middle, the resilience or you know the home base or something can make the difference between that event being a traumatic event for me and somebody else without those types of resources, those types of things to lean on, they may result in trauma to them, but they may not result in trauma to me. So the mitigating factors, I think, comes in there in the middle. Okay, so trauma is highly subjective. Like we could yeah. be in the same class, um, undergoing the same set of things, but one comes out uh, different from the other. And we will, um, we will, we will at least try to break down this. So Saya is here, the one who's appearing as Karen on the screen. Um, Saya, we have, Saya is my brother, if you can see the resemblance, it's just that he balded uh, faster and he's a vegan, I'm not. That's it, those are two differences. But um, Saya, we've, we've, um, we've, we've, we've um, said what trauma is and what abuse is. Um, I usually want to, 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 to look at the history of of where where we where we are, and Sai usually does a very good job, and that's his work. He's there, you know. The, if you go for church, he'll show the big Ted moment. When you go for the live show, the person who introduces the whole thing. I just want Sai to just do that, and then we'll go to the teachers, because um, the thera the Joanne, you're there on the therapy side. The therapists uh, have, have given us the definitions and even if Trish has chimed in, we will go to the teacher side, but in the intermission now is um, Karen Sire over there. So Sire, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, thanks for having me here. And yeah, maybe the balding is a sign of trauma. Um, being a son, his brother is not easy. Yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are mitigating factors. Um, I was I was six years old when I was in class one, um, and I was a small guy. And I remember carrying a letter home. I I didn't know what its contents were, but I would soon learn that what it, what the letter was simply saying is that I had performed been performing so badly in school. That's in class one. This is by term two. I'd been performing so badly in school that the school said, uh, if I didn't improve, I would be expelled. Now, just some history I had um, been number, my first exam was number 35 um, out of, I think 37. Um, and then my second exam, I improved by one position because one guy didn't do the exam. So it, it's kind of a zero sum game. Now, when you, when, you, when you tell a father, an African father, that their son is not doing well, and imagine if by class one, term two, the teachers have looked at you and they're like, mm, we've drawn this graph. Mm -mm. This one is not going well. And this was not a private school. This was a public, um, this was a public school. So imagine how the outlook was bad. But just pause there, pause that story there. 
and let's go backwards a hundred years um, backwards. Not that I was alive then. I'm imagining how a similar scenario would unfold. And you know what? It wouldn't because education as we currently run it, at least in Africa, is very new. It's actually something we are battling with. Recently in Kenya, we have introduced what we call the competence-based curriculum. And I think if there's ever a system that has become a subject of meetings and everything, CBC. Yet, CBC is more close to what is truly African than any other. So how did we study? How did we used to learn in Africa? Africa didn't have formal, the format of school we have. We had a formal schooling way, but it was not the format um, that we had. We studied through apprenticeship. We studied through learning by doing, and we studied what we needed for survival. Specializations were already predetermined in that if you're born into the line of blacksmiths, you'd become a blacksmith. If you're born into the, the line of the medicine man or the medicine woman, that's a line of the trade you'd learn. Um, this is probably brought out very well when you look at our names. And one tribe that is very good at making you see this is the Kikuyu. Um, Kikuyu sun names are really not sun names. They are trade names. So when somebody's called Murimi, that is a farmer. When somebody's called Wajohi, that is the guy who was making the brew. So uh, when somebody was called Getoga, that was a businessman. So Kikuyu's sun names were really their trade names, what they, what they learned. And this is because in Africa, we didn't go to school. We didn't go to a class eight to five, but we studied um, by observing and then there was apprenticeship. And then the closest we ever came to boarding school was during rites of passage, where like among the Kisi and the Kalenjin, and even among the Luya, um, the boys who'd reached uh, maturity age would, um, circumcision age would be taken away, um, sequestered at times in a forest or in a special house, away from home to be given special training in what it means to be a man. And, it were, and at times it was also partly military training. Otherwise, apart from that, there was never a boarding school arrangement. There was never an arrangement in Africa where you lived away from parental care and community observation um, for the longest time. And the, and the net result of this was a few very interesting things. Number one, Africa never had a jobless person. There was nothing like unemployment. It, it didn't exist because you were trained in a certain line. And, and that's why a lot of our cultures um, speak very badly about laziness, idleness. When you look at, uh, around the culture we built, say around bride price and bride wealth, it wasn't for extortion, it was for demonstration that this person has ability to be able to generate wealth. And so comes the, again, the, um, our European visitors come in and you notice by the time they're arriving in the um, late 18s, what has really happened back home in, um, for them back home in Europe is the industrial revolution. And what the industrial revolution had done is schools had been patterned alongside the model of the factory. In fact, if you look at, I had the privilege of going to a, a school that was built by colonialists. When you look at the layout of the school and you look at the layout of a factory, it's really much the same. For the first time we had things we didn't ever have in Africa. Number one was age sequestered classes. In Africa, we did not have age sequestered anything. What people did is they lived and operated within age groups. So people within five to 10 years were considered your age group. And you, you did life together, um, whether it's among the Maasai or the Luya, uh, people five to 10 years within your age, that was your age group. But the new education system put a class six, uh, put a age six in class one, and uh, age seven in class two, and we were completely sequestered. Um, of course, the horrors of this would be clearly seen when you get to high school, that individuals who are three years apart <laughs> end up bullying each other, mistreating each other. They're really the same exact age group, but form ones are called all manner of names and form force feel they're like the biggest thing that ever happened um, in this world. The second thing that happened that disrupted our schooling um, system was 
there was a disruption. There was a complete disunion between learning and doing. So we ended up spending 16, you know, some occasions, 20 years learning. And then after that is when we would go to, to do. And naturally this system was helpful for guys who are more cerebral than guys who are more action oriented. And because it again beginning creating strata where people who are people's worth begin, began being compared by what they could reproduce from memory, it began creating new cliques or new divisions within the existing um, divisions. The normal human instinct for competition kicked in and many schools functionally stopped being schools and they became nothing more than glorified drilling centers where from class six in preparation for KCP, all that was being done was being drilled, 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 drilled. Parents seemed not to be um, contented with this and we introduced what I personally feel is one of the most horrible things ever, which was primary school boarding. Um, children as young as class two, in some cases, class one were taken to boarding for no other reason, but in, in many times it was for parental convenience and in many others it was because we were having an eye for the grades to be attained. Let me just pause there and, and say something here. Boarding as a concept began initially, I think in the UK, it became, it, it initially something that was done by very rich people who were able to provide very close to home like um, circumstances within a boarding arrangement. Um, the need for boarding of course escalated during the two world wars where because of security concerns, children had to be put away from home and put away from the major cities. So what initially started as a rich man's thing or as a temporary arrangement, when it came to Africa was taken as a full-time thing. And so we ended up creating a boarding institution. So you can imagine that within a period of 50 years, Africa's education system was taken basically out, not even overturned, it was taken completely out. And then things were introduced there like a boarding system, a school grading system, a factory system, uh, an age sequestered system. And all of that melee put together, we ended up in a situation where our educators were learning our education system with children who are trying to adapt into this whole thing and parents who are trying to readapt into what this new world looks like. And it was a whole mess. So back to my story. So here I am as a six-year-old. What was my parents' solution? They introduced boarding. I mean, not boarding, they introduced home tuition for me. So for me, it meant schooling never stopped, never. It meant I went to school from class one, went to class, came home, there was home tuition. So I either had homework from home to do in school and homework from school to do at home. So you can imagine for, for me, up to now, when I sit back and think about my schooling, what happened to me between class one and class three is a days completely. It's a, I don't remember, but somehow, and now I know why. Um, it's just, it was a purely developmental thing. My mind was not ready, as most boys are not, um, for formal sitting in a classroom arrangement. But somehow, when I reached class four, my mind was able to kick in, and I was able to then my grades began improving. Don't, don't be fooled. Um, the tuition and stuff moved me. I moved from number 36 to number 10 in one term. You know, then I moved from number 10 to number two um, in another term. So the external stimuli could produce results, but the net result for me was to be seen down the road. By the time I was reaching campus, I realized I was very tired. It felt like I'd been in school for forever. I, I graduated top of my class, all of that, but I personally remember school and education became a very traumatizing thing in its initial phase and I had to feel the burnout down the road. So today as we discuss, I think it, it's proper to put it um, that our trauma with school is first communal. As an African people, the education systems we have had, whether it's 762, 844, CBC, are all experiments. Every person has been involved. Then secondly, the places and the points of trauma are not just at home, they are in school and they're because of many things that have been inverted. And I'm looking very excitedly to learn from the team about what the experiences have been, but more importantly, what the solutions would be. Back to you in studio, Posa. Hey, Kweli, in studio. Stufunge tuande nyumbani, tumamaliza.
<laughs> okay, yeah, th this is why Saya should have kept time and, and, and started this before we go to definitions, you agree? Um, and with Saya's story and the definitions we've had from the from Mukimba and, jo and Joanne, um, let's go to Trish and Jackie. And Jackie, because you have not spoken, with all that in mind, your training from in Kenya, I'm, I'm considering all cadres from the untrained teacher to the ECD teacher, all the way to Professor Magoha, who taught me in a medical school. Uh, this is not saying anything medical school, but uh, but he's um, I'm just saying he's in the wrong profession at the at the right uh, right now, and this is talking a lot about the current system. But are you? informed about trauma what do you know about trauma and what presents to you um, that makes you feel that this child is traumatized jackie let's start with you okay um thank you everyone i don't think trauma is something that especially in our context um, is discussed a lot. I would say there's, there's a lot of talk about abuse, there's awareness about the situations at home or things at school that may affect the kids, but the, the use of the terminology trauma is very rare and I believe there are teachers in the group who will agree with me. It's not, I've, I mean, I've, I've been within the 844 rather local curriculum schools and international schools and you rarely hear the use of the word trauma so I'm wondering as I listen to to the, my fellow panelists speak whether we are so behind or whether we have our own way of looking at kids who are usually affected by various circumstances whether it's at school or the situations at home it doesn't mean that we are not aware that there are problems because we will see kids and we know that you can tell there's a problem by the way the child responds to circumstances in school. You observe this child and you can tell uh, they are not their usual self. They are overly shy, they are timid, they, 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 they overreact. I guess that, that falls under hypervigilance. So we, we are very much aware and that's why we have the, the guidance and counseling program. That's, that's why we now have um, the learning support departments in a number of schools. But the use of the term trauma is very rare and I'd love to hear from the other members of, of the studio audience later on if uh, the situation is different. So for me, trauma, from the experience I've had and the discussion with colleagues would be anything that affects the child's proper functioning in terms of executive functions, ability to form relationships with peers, ability to form relationships with teachers and other adults around the school, poor self-regulation, you know, then you have all these questions that make you decide, okay, I think we need to involve the learning support department, we need to involve the the school counselor, etc., etc. So it is there. What probably we need to agree on is what then constitutes trauma. I think for a start, I'll leave it at that. Okay, and Jackie, I know I did a disservice to the whole um, team. Would you <laughs> kindly just um, introduce yourself and, and exactly what you do so that uh, people know? And this is all the panelists. It's my fault because I know all of you. I'm assuming if you are knows of you, uh, all of you, it's trauma. I've said everything now. <laughs> trauma. So just introduce yourself. Okay, uh, my name is Jacqueline Aminga. Well, people call me Jackie, which is okay. I'm a school teacher, and I'm also the head of a school that has uh, children from the age of two to 18, 19. So basically I have experience all through working with the nursery school, primary school, uh, lower secondary and uh, senior school kids. So my life is basically full, almost watching from the early stages of development to the time we allow them to go out to university or college. Yeah. Um, uh, let's, Trish, let's go to you as, um, as an 844 graduate and um, who's gone, who crossed over and is in um, a different school system. 
and you actually cater to um, the most neglected children in in, in Kenya, the special needs um, children. What, um, what's your training like, and what um, what shows up as trauma on your side? And you can introduce yourself also. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Patricia Wahu um, Parker. I am a special educator, predominantly for students who are diagnosed with autism. So a wide range, um, they fall under the ASD spectrum. And um, we serve students from the ages of nine through to 21. Um, my role primarily is to um, sit in on the meetings that generate the child's IEP. That's the Individualized Education Program. And um, I chair those meetings and doing those meetings and um, it, it takes it takes a lot. And during that time, you, you start to understand what trauma is and how it affects a child's education. And um, in terms of the school, how we as educators contribute to that trauma, um, it can come in different forms. Um, as a former 844 um, student, it came in the form of teachers giving, you know, subliminal comments like you're not going to amount to anything, um, the prefects versus the rest of us, um, or you're from Nairobi, so you must be spoiled. So those little, little innuendos, at the end of the day, as a child, it, you know, it inter you internalize all that stuff. And then you start to manifest it in how you perform in school because you may be sitting down, this teacher walks in and you say to, to yourself, this is a teacher that doesn't like me. So your focus is primarily on trying to please this teacher, trying to make sure you don't get into trouble, trying to make sure you're doing everything right. And if this teacher is coming in with their own biases against you, I don't think there's anything in the world that you can do to change their perception of you. And so instead of the child focusing on what you're teaching, they're focusing primarily on whether you like them whether they're doing what they're supposed to be doing rather than just being a child sitting in a classroom and learning. In order for learning to take place, a child has to come to class with the mindset on learning, like a clear, a clear slate, no underlying worries, no underlying um, um, concerns. And in that you're able to have an open space to you know, get into the child's mind and be able to educate. But if they're coming in with apprehensions, concerns um, based on past experiences, then there's a blockage and you're not able to get through. Um, many of us say that, you know, we didn't experience any trauma when we were high school, everything was all nice and dandy. But in all honesty, if you sit down and really think about it, being told to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, that really is not okay for a child. You're not getting enough sleep. And it affects you as a person. It, it, it affects your health, it, it causes stress, and your ability to manage stress becomes compromised. So when you sit down and you think about those things, sometimes you don't even know you're going through an event that is abusive to you as a person mentally or physically until the aftermath, when, when you're burnt out, when you're stressed out, and now you have an awareness of what that event was and you start thinking about it and you're like, oh my gosh, I've really gone through it. you know. And that's when now your therapists come in to support you in trying to unpack those incidences, unpack those experiences and chart a way forward. So in terms of the students that I serve, um, like I mentioned, they're predominantly students with autism. Um, we have them um, on the spectrum. So we have those who are lower functioning and we have those who are higher functioning. And each one comes in with their own set of um, difficulties, um, sets of challenges. And it's in how we as the educators support them to navigate those um, challenges and to be able to overcome them, that will be the determining factor of whether they leave traumatized or they leave with the tools that they need to succeed in future. So that's my take on it. Okay, I, I, I feel like people are having a problem with the word um, trauma and it's, uh, it's those unfortunate words, the other unfortunate word in the medical terminologies is abortion. In the medical world, both, um, if you have a miscarriage, we still call it an abortion. If you procured an abortion yourself, we still call it an abortion. So when you look at your clinical notes, when um, a doctor writes, like you went to hospital and had a miscarriage, it will be written one form of the other, but it will be an abortion. It's a terminology. It's a correct terminology, but it's stigmatized. Um, trauma is also the correct terminology in this case, because as, as um, 
Mukimba and everyone else on the panel said, it's what happens to us as in how we react to it. And I don't know how else we can call it, but it is um, trauma. And one of the ways we can start uh, destigmatizing, school teachers don't come at me, um, uh, destigmatizing the word is by talking about it. And this is one of the reasons we are doing this. Um, so Joanne, I think you had such a listing the the uh, the way the means and ways um, we traumatize children knowingly or unknowingly, and we can um, talk. We can include the explicit and implicit bias, as um, Trish talked about it. The the in my mother tongue, the pon town children get when they go to schools in shags. Um, uh, could you just go through uh, you and um, Mukimba and, your, and Joanne? Could you get, just go through how we traumatize and who are traumatizing um, um, the children? And we can start, as Saya said, from the community all the way into the schools. And the custodial staff should not be left out because um, uh, most uh, some of our painful experiences in schools are also through um, the custodial staff. Let, let's just go through how we traumatize the, the children. Jo Joanne, you we can to start. Oh, who wants okay. to start? Okay, Joanne, just go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll first start with introducing myself. My name is Joanne Mwangi. I am a, a life coach, um, and I specifically coach adults who are wanting to identify and heal their trauma. So majority of my clients have either gone to therapy and are still having a hard time trying to figure out what happened to them versus what needed to happen for them and therefore identifying what did not happen for them as children to, to um, fill in the gaps as adults because what happened to us as children or what did not happen to us or what did not happen for us as children affects who we become as adults and the systems which we grow up in is your home system your community your educational systems your religious systems and all those systems combined are capable of creating trauma or 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 um traumatizing you as a child and therefore we don't want to say that school is the only place that creates trauma for a child but how does uh, a dysfunctional home create trauma for a child in 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 a way that then that child is unable to function in the educational system that they go to. What is happening in school that then makes it impossible for that child to function in the home system, right? So like we'll use um, Saya as an example. This is a six-year-old child in standard one who has been told he is performing badly. He is, he needs help. He's going to be expelled from school. Now, when you take that home, are the parents going to support this child in a way that is loving, that is not shaming, uh, to ensure that this child is able to function in this school system? Now, our school systems, especially in Kenya, have a very high tendency of being perfectionistic and shaming, right? It's a graded system. and especially in my time, I went to the, the, the system that was before um, 844. Our grades were published outside the classroom. So you knew who was number one, who was the last. And therefore that encouraged other children to bully you. It gave teachers an idea of who is smart, who is not smart in the class. And all these things were not, con the where the child is coming from or the in environment the child is coming from was not truly considered, or at least I don't feel was considered by the educators to take time to understand what is going on with this child. Why are they not able to perform? What needs to be done for them to be able to perform better? Or is maybe this education system not the right education system for them? And then there's all the other intersectionalities that come with that. There's poverty 
poverty means a child has not eaten well or maybe is living in an environment where they cannot get enough sleep at night because it's dangerous and therefore they are unable to function in the, edu in the, in the classroom. So when I uh, have my people uh, enroll in class, we go through a, a, a child's life from con conception all the way to adulthood. When we are born, we all as children have very specific needs. You need to be nurtured, you need to be loved, you need to be fed. There's all the basic needs a child needs. Um, and if those needs are not met in any stage of a child's life, then there are some kinds of traumas that happen there. And the traumas are not necessarily big things, they could be small things. And the best example I give is usually an infant who has been born and is colicky. The child who cries and cries and cries for days and days and days nonstop. The mother cannot figure out, is this child sick? Is this child allergic to something? Is this child crying because they are uncomfortable, because they are hot or they are cold, the child just cries. And what happens with adults most of the time is we get tired and you leave that child to just cry. But what that child is doing is recording everything that is happening to them at that moment. And the, the child from age zero to seven is pretty much recording all the things that are happening to them and around them. And therefore, that is recorded as abandonment. So that child starts feeling abandoned and starts feeling like their needs or rather records that their needs are not important because the child could be crying just because they want to be held. But then also mothers have been conditioned to not hold a child because that is spoiling a child, right? So the child is left to self-soothe. And therefore, when they go to school, are they able to self-soothe? Are they able to self-regulate like Jackie said? Maybe or maybe not. So those little things that happen along the line constitute as trauma. Some of them may be big. Some of them may, be, may not be big. But that child is recording what's going on in the home. If the child is in a violent home, even if they're little, they're young between the ages of zero to seven and the mother is being beaten up, that child is recording that and it is messing up their regulation, their, um, what is it called? Their nervous system because they're always in a flight or fight mode because they don't know what the next hour is going to bring. So that child is not going to be high functioning or functioning in the quote unquote normal way that a child their age would be functioning in, in an education system. So those are the things we are calling trauma because that is exactly what it is. The way the body responds to external elements that dysregulate the nervous system of a child. Okay, um, Mukimba, I think you can go ahead and um, I think uh, because you're the, uh, the person who deals with um, adverse childhood experiences, I have some slides, um, you, we can go through that and if you can piggyback, but just my slides will be, will pop up in a few seconds, but just um, uh, piggyback on what Joan has said. Okay. I think, yeah, the first thing was I noticed also in the comment sections, the fear of the word trauma. Trauma is a wound, it's a wound and we respond to a wound. We can be angry if I get hit and my arm breaks, we can't be angry at the fact that my arm is broken. And it's the same thing that happens with our minds. And that's just all it is. It doesn't have to be something that we should be so scared of. The mind is also extremely amazing. It can rewire itself. There's neuroplasticity. So we're lucky in that element. We can just, we can always reform. So the fear of the word trauma should not exist because it's just like saying, if I hit you and you get hurt or you bleed, then something must be wrong with you. That's not the case. It just means that there was a force that hit and your skin broke or your bones broke, yeah? So my name is Mukimba Rahedi. I am a counseling psychologist. I'm also a young adults coach. I love young adults. I love reaching out to people, especially at that age when, again, there's still a lot of neuroplasticity that can happen. There's still a lot of formation. Joanne is dealing with them when they're adults and you know they're 
already up and dealing with the world. I want to prevent, you know, those things from happening and us entering into bad relationships and finding out that, uh, this is all my trauma. This is all my trauma. It's picking up like, you know, like Saya said, it, it can just show up randomly. As an adult, you thought you were good. You thought you grew up just fine, especially for us as Africans. There are a lot of us who thought everything that happened to us was absolutely normal because it happens everywhere. It's the same in every household. And we don't ever really think that there's something wrong. And until we're adults, that's when it hits us that, oh my God, this is so messed up. Something went wrong. That was trauma. The way I'm responding is not the way I should be responding. I'm in survival mode. Like the aces, what they do, they stick us into that survival mode. And we're stuck into that level where Joanne was saying we've collected all the information and we've translated it into either danger or a threat. And so our brain tells us to stick to that survival mode. And unfortunately, if that affects our immunity. It affects everything about how we process information. So I could be processing an event very differently from somebody else who had no experience of trauma like I did. So yeah, uh, shouldn't be something we scared. That word is just the word. It's a really simple. It's a wound. We should, we should embrace it for what it is. Okay, and, do, do, yeah. do you want to just um, give a small spiel about what ACEs are? Yes, uh, so ACEs are what we talk about a lot. Um, I think it depends on who is giving the presentation. Like you told me you didn't want us to get so clinical. So between the ages of zero or even actually from conception to the point we're about 16, some cases they say 18, but these are all those adverse experiences that happen during our childhood that are mostly, they've been collected as what should be translated to traumatic events. Now, once they happen, um, I can see on the slides, there's, they've been divided into abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Um, again, like I said, the mitigating circumstances make a huge difference because I can see something like divorce here. And it's also really important that some moments like those, some parents are really safe and intentional about the way they handle situations. So one divorce can be extremely traumatic for a child and another divorce can be a very different experience. So again, mitigating circumstances, but what happens in our childhood really affects us because our brains, I wish I had a graph. Our brains are very, they're very malleable when we're younger. And they stop getting as malleable as, as we grow older. So when we are younger, we are collecting that information, like Joe and said, we're collecting it and we're collecting it and we're sticking to that narrative. And by the time we're older, there's not much else we can, there's, there's a lot we can do, but we're kind of stuck to our ways. Yes, I, I can see that the brain, when we're smaller, between I think ages zero to five, yeah? Our brains, our lower brains are more developed. They're actually very developed. When we're born, our first, the lower part of our brain, the brain stem, that's responsible for the winking, the basics, the breathing, the trying to sit upright and all that stuff. It's very developed. But the other parts of the brain are still trying to adjust. And like now during those formative years, the zero to seven years, that's when we're going through that emotional brain. And that's when we are collecting the information with the limbic brain, yeah, the emotional brain. That's the part that just does that survival stuff. It has the survival mode stuff. And it's, that's unfortunately where most of us get stuck because of our trauma, because it becomes either overdeveloped and overutilized because we're in such survival mode because again of the adverse childhood experiences, because we're stuck in that mode we tend to have an overdeveloped limbic brain, an overdeveloped emotional brain with the hypervigilance, with the, the fight or flight, so we're overly aggressive or overly complacent. And here's where the people pleasing comes in, which is a lot of what most of us experience as adults without really realizing that this was as a source of the, 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 the experiences that we had when we were younger. 
And then the rational mind, that's now the part we should be trying to nurture. And the only way it can be nurtured is if we are controlling the types of responses that are happening here and we're reducing the amount of survival that needs to be done in those formative years. That's why safety is important. That's why nurturing, validation, even in excess, yes, there's no harm in producing producing such an overly safe environment, an overly nurturing environment at this young age, so that we can be able to allow for the, the neocortex, since you want your children to engage their creative parts, their mathematical parts, the language, all those amazing skills that we want them to have, the school should ensure that the validation, the nurturing is very, very maintained during that period of time. Um, yeah. Okay, I think- I hope I was a bit clear. <laughs> yes, you are clear, I was echoing. Sorry, you're very, very clear. Um, I will read that comment, it's too long. Um, so let's let's go to the to the teachers. Unless, Joanne, you wanted to add something on the ACEs, then we can go to the, 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 the teaching, the people who should be paid a million bucks, fraternity. <laughs> Um, I think I think I think Mukimba uh, explained the aces pretty well. Um, I do want to piggyback and just make it super clear that when a child is in one traumatic environment, if there is a human being somewhere in any spaces that that child goes to, that shows up as a loving, caring, nurturing human being that sees the child, that validates the child's emotion, that creates a safe space for them. That is what Kimba was talking about, mitigating. So you could be in a traumatic home environment, but the teacher is loving and caring and sees you and provides a safe space. That child will always know there is a safe space in their life where they can thrive. But um, those who tend to not, um, not emerge out of that trauma are those who are in environment, all environments that are traumatic. So you go to school, the teacher is mean-spirited, the children are mean-spirited. So like, let's take, for example, a child from a poverty-stricken home. Maybe they're living in the slums. The parents are struggling to provide for that child, right? But the child is still going to school. Maybe they don't have water, running water. So the child maybe stinks. So the other children, um, are bullying this child for smelling a certain way. And then the teacher adds on to that by um, using language that is not kind to that child. So this child is struggling at home. This child is struggling in school. There's no safe space for that child. There's no space for that child to bounce back. There's no space where this child is feeling wanted or worthy. And therefore, all these little things that happen to them become at some point, a big T trauma, because now they have to start creating personas to show up a certain way in every environment they go to. So those are the things we are talking about that not necessarily are big things that are big events, like maybe being beaten by a teacher, which is traumatic, but it's many small things that happen to a child that end up being um, traumatic to that child's life. And, and that's why the, the slide for the uh, PCEs, the positive child experiences is there. Um, but let's go to the teachers. Um, um, uh, Trish, let's start with you. So what does a, a, um, an, a school, a trauma-informed space look, uh, look in, your, in your view? Like a, a school, if you are to redo 844 again, what would a trauma-informed space look for, for, for you as a teacher? So generally, it would start with um, supporting the teachers, um, providing them with the training that they need. Because also sometimes you find that when teachers are under a lot of pressure, it kind of filters down to the students, right? So you, you, you have to take care of the teachers in order for the teachers to be able to take care of the students. Um, 
Introducing a, a strong guidance and counseling um, program in the school would also be helpful, where you have people who are trained um, to support students who are struggling um, in terms of their um, social emotional well being. So that would be because um, the teacher can't really do it all. You have a class full of 30 students, in some cases, 40, because I remember in primary school, I think we were like 42 in a class. And that one teacher cannot cater emotionally to all those people because as a human being, even as an adult, you also have your own emotional issues you're dealing with. So being able to divide yourself amongst 40 people in one space, in one sitting, period after period after period is difficult. So having a um, guidance and counseling um, department where students are able to go and speak to somebody and, and you know be seen and be heard because that is also paramount. The, this, the child has to know that they're being seen. They have to know that they're being heard. And if I have a class of 40 students, I really cannot show that like fully. You know, my, my it, it, attention cannot be undivided and just focus on one student. Because again, me focusing on one student could also cause trauma for the other kids because it looks like favoritism. So having a guidance counseling department in the school where students are able to go and it should be a safe space, not a place where I go and share and then next thing I know the whole school knows my business. You know, it has to be a safe place. And also we as teachers and adults have to be able to provide that safe space where if a student comes to talk to you, it's not now you use that information to, you know, if the child is acting out, you're using that information to bring them back into check because you're making them scared that you may go and tell somebody or something like that. So you have to be their safe haven, at, you know, when they're in your classroom. Um, the other thing also is just to have a school culture that supports the well being of all the students. Um, as adults, you know, the training process before people become teachers, you know, certified and all that you have to um, consider the social emotional well being of the students, not just the academics, the academics, the academics. Some students are not academic driven, you know, some people are better with their hands, and they may do better with a trade. So just being able to understand that as an educator, and meeting students at their point of entry, you know, I can't just assume because we're all in standard six, we have to be having standard six brains, we have to know you know, basic stuff that starts in standard six. No, we have to meet the student at their point of entry. It has to be an individualized approach, you know, knowing the student first before anything else and forming relationships with the students as well. Um, kids are not gonna talk to somebody they don't like. Kids are not gonna speak to somebody they're scared of. So you wanna be able to be approachable and just start forming relationships with your students. So if you get your class roster, and you see a student on your roster that you've heard in the building, you know, could be problematic because teachers talk what goes around the school that this child is this, this child is that, and that also the mislabeling, you know, labeling students and and then we may not necessarily call you the label that is being said, but subconsciously we behave in a way that you know makes you understand that you know I've heard something about you. So being cognizant, just being how can I put it, mentally aware of the output that we're giving out to our students and knowing that sometimes the response we're getting from them is based off of what we're giving. So just having teachers have that knowledge, like just training teachers, have them do like psychology classes, understand the developmental stages and understand you know, that behavior is not necessarily the person. Sometimes they're just trying to communicate with you do not label a child based on their behavior. Do not associate them, say, this child is bad because it's the behavior, it's not the child. So you also have to understand that, be mature enough to understand that, that kids are not their behavior. It's outside elements that cause them to behave the way they do. And understanding that is paramount. But I just think all in all, it's just being that safe place and understanding that if it's a situation that you cannot handle, if there's a guidance and counseling program in the school, you can refer that student, you know, rather than now go talk to another teacher, that teacher can handle it, they go talk to another teacher. So then it just becomes a domino effect and that child's business is on the street. So if there's a guidance and counseling um, department in the school where people are actually trained to handle such and certain situations, it would help. Okay, uh, J Jackie, the same question. What does that, that look, uh, especially given your resources, 
Okay, thank you. I'd, I'd just like to add on to what Trish, you called that Patricia has said, and um, she's obviously mentioned uh, guidance and counseling programs. I believe that every school that cares about children should have someone that the kids can actually go to and feel safe. It's like setting up a safe haven in, in school. Within the um, academic or leadership structure, there should be, uh, like in the case of where I work, the pastoral element where students know that I can, if I don't find the counselor, I can go to this person and my secret will be safe, my concerns will be safe. So the only thing that happens is that the, the pastoral person then determines whether it's something that needs to go to the counselor or it's something that she or he can handle. Uh, we set up policies, you know, policies that are trauma free. Unfortunately, in the school setup, because of high levels of accountability, expectations from parents on what makes a perfect school, expectations from school leaders and school owners and all that, when a child does this, this should be the sanction. I think it's important for schools to, to move from the black and white kind of thinking when they're setting up sanctions and consider the, the children uh, based again on, you know, like the, the other panelists, panelists have said, not one size fits all approach. So you, you have policies in place, you know that uh, this needs to be dealt with, but it's the sensitivity with which you handle it, the whole process, how you go about it, what in communication goes to the child, how you involve the family that I think makes all the difference on whether whatever sanctions you come up with will traumatize the child and the family or not. Uh, schools that care about children should have child protection policies because when you have that policy and it's live, not just something that is in the document for maybe inspectors, then you're able to continuously amend policies to fit the needs of the emerging issues. Uh, you know that this child is coming from a uh, home and there's a situation, how do we protect this child? You know that um, in our school, this is what is expected, this is how we handle children, this is how we deal with this kind of behavior when it manifests. How do we make sure that every member of staff is aware that these are the parameters, uh, this is how to go about supporting our learners? We believe all schools should be very very strong um, proponents of safeguarding right from how you welcome kids when they come to school from how you uh, you organize your break time supervision your lunch time supervision because again some of these traumatic experiences happen in the playground happen when kids are out there free during during play time that's that's the time somebody will be bullied that's the time somebody will uh, experience aggression from other students so what is the role of teachers in making sure that the safe, the safe guarding practices are actually implemented effectively? The other thing, um, in addition to guidance and counseling, I believe every good school should have, or, or rather a school that is trauma sensitive or is aware that we have children who are different, who are able differently, who are going through issues and may not learn because of some hindrances that we may not be aware of, should have a learning support department because it's in the learning support department that you they discover something. Uh, I believe it's uh, Re, Re, not Joanne, Rahedi who talked something about processing because when you find yourself in a classroom where everybody else seems to be following and you're wondering what the teacher is talking about and you're wondering what the discussion is about not because you are not there not because you didn't get the instructions but because everything is just passing over your head and uh, and the teacher doesn't understand why you're not getting it and the other students don't understand why you're not getting it what they don't know is that there's something invisible that you don't even know that you're struggling with and they don't know so you're automatically labeled as dumb for lack of a better word what happens in schools that have a learning support department is that of course then this observation will be made communication will be made to the learning support department and then the process of assessing and finding out how best we can support these children as opposed to letting them go through school in a way that is traumatizing to them this is where now i would say the curriculum actually can can can, can traumatize kids 
we have programs that create, you know, a good school should have a program that creates awareness even amongst the kids, not just the, the, the teachers. Like, uh, there are schools that do what they call personal social health and education programs where they have times where they discuss about relationships, about friendships, about families, about conflict and all those things. So that sense of awareness amongst the staff and the students makes it easier for children to actually come up and express themselves when they're maybe they have a challenge. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult when you implement practices in a school and then the kids go home to an environment that is totally uninformed and that's where a school should involve the parents by having sessions not to discuss um, you know the, the academic clinics but sessions that just discuss the well-being and the general growth about the kids and you schools should also consider reporting practices because most of the times the report cards that go home are academic reports he does this he doesn't concentrate, that's the reason for these results. How about getting to a, a, a state where we just talk about the child as a person and how they are developing? And we have all these parameters that if the child is not meeting, then we start asking what's going on? Is it the school? Is it the home environment? Or are there other factors that could, could be affecting the development of this child? And of course, there are campaigns that should never stop, probably on a timely basis campaigns such as anti-bullying campaigns and any other thing that is there is you know creating awareness and enabling the, the teachers because sometimes even adults don't know what constitutes uh, uh, bullying for example and then what is the school culture like generally because if the adults themselves don't treat each other with respect or bully each other or behave aggressively towards each other how do you expect the adults to actually support the children. So I think the school culture should uh, should be the kind of culture where the children and the adults know this is what is acceptable, this is what is not acceptable, this is how we are supposed to create a family, a warm environment where everybody feels safe. Thanks. And, and for all that Jackie has said, how does it just become organic instead of us just checking a box? like? like just naturally you know you're not supposed to bully a child instead of huku ha, no swahili has to come here huku hatu chapangi watoto you, you, you i don't know is is english is not my strongest subject but i'm just wondering how do we make that what all that those nice things you got you, you've all said to just be naturally organic how do we make the movement from um Oshawa in Mombasa to uh, Ebushibungo Primary School in uh, in my in my shards. How do we just make it naturally organic? And any anyone can take a step. Uh, this is just me asking. It's not the yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I had read an amazing quote some time back, and they said that anybody in any form of leadership to any form of role where there, there's a hierarchy of concern, yeah? So that's a parent, that's a teacher, that's literally any one of us, yeah? Should be required to seek out therapy or some form of formal coaching, yeah? And I think that self-work needs to be done by all our caregivers. From our parents, that healing needs to happen. The teachers, that healing needs to happen. Even the, like you said, the other workers in school, they also need to figure out because a lot of the stuff, how we behave, how we behave even towards our children, how we behave towards these kids is always as a result of some unhealed trauma right inside us, yeah? But how always how is my Ebushibungo person gonna, because you see, this is very um, bougie. What we are doing here, my Ebushibungo person is, is making dinner right now we'll never know about trauma we'll never know he needs he or she needs to heal an inner child i am campaigning for my Shibungo person just help me for maybe i can help you on that eh? on the uh, aspect who? of uh posa posa aswani maybe yeah, oh, i can help you on that on the who aspect is speaking? of i'm sorry who spoke oh dr olive <laughs> okay sorry this is dr olive uh, not medical oh. eh? okay no problem mm. so, yeah so maybe i can help you on in terms of eshubungu 
primary. Yeah. What is happening with CBC? Yeah? There, be, there, there, there is a program which is called the P, P, E, and E, Parental mm. Engagement and Empowerment. And one of the aspects of the empowerment, there is an element of advocacy, where now the schools have been mandated not only to engage the parents, but also to empower them. So the schools and the CBC, the public and the private, they, they are supposed to begin building capacity for the parents, inviting them to school and training them on the emerging issues. And I think that is something, if it is done well, it will see a lot of changes in terms of trauma. Because if you think about the child in Eshuvungu, there's the trauma which comes from the environment, the, 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 the macro environment where the child might be walking 10 kilometers to go to school without shoes, not, the child has not taken breakfast and all that. So by the, the, by the time the child arrives in school, already the child is stressed. And in the long run, it becomes a trauma to the child. And yet this is a child who has potential. So this issue of, uh, of trauma will be, is, is being sorted out actually in most of the schools because of the parent engagement empowerment. And it will take long for schools to catch up. There are schools already which are, who are really involved in it. They invite counselors, they invite um, 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 psychologists, they invite all sorts of people to come to school and build capacity for our parents. And that is, I, I can guarantee you that is happening. And the parents are excited because that is not a culture which we were used to in Kenyan public and, 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 and our curriculum, the 844. Then another issue we should also be careful with, it is the issue of 844. Remember 844 used to, to, to support or used to be more, uh, more leaning on one intelligence, the logical intelligence. And it used to leave all the other multiple intelligences aside. So all of us, we were, we were bundled in, into a summative assessment or exam, which only was supporting one intelligence. And that is why after you complete high school and you go to university and you graduate, you come to discover, oh, I'm not supposed to be a doctor. I don't even love this job because that was not your intelligence. It happened that you are very good logically, but maybe you are more of a, a naturist. You are supposed to be an environment person somewhere. So you find all these things when empowerment and engagement comes in and parents are able to be taken through all these things. I think the trauma in terms of education will go low. We can never outroll it because there are so many triggers of uh, uh, trauma. But in terms of the school building the environment where as far as the four walls of the schools are concerned, the teachers and the stakeholders can actually help the children. And I, I believe the engagement and the empowerment, the parental engagement and the empowerment which has been introduced by the Ministry of Education it, it is helping and it is continue, it will continue helping uh, the schools and even learners. So, so this, this mandate and all these things have left the paper and my Ebishivungo people are being catered for. Yes, yes. They are being, I believe you me, things are happening. Things okay. are happening because the government is telling you, you don't need to go and call Joanne to come and talk about trauma. You can look at a resource person in the village who can come and talk to the girls about growing up. You understand? You can look at a resource person who is based in town from the school, someone who has gone through the school and there's, there's somebody in the society and they have the skills and the knowledge which the school is looking for and they come and empower the parents. So this is basically a, a parent program which has been introduced by the Ministry of Education because of CBC. It is called parental engagement and empowerment. And I think with the baby steps we have been taking, in the long run, we are going to see the impact 
but it is not going to be quick because it is something new. Uh, 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 parents are not used to be called to school and sit for one hour to be trained. Hello? <laughs> so it is something so new. They are used to, I call you to school to come and we talk about the way Jackie said, let's talk about your child results. That is why most of the parents, when they are called, they know Nanda Kuitua Vile Mtoto Ame perform. But now I'm calling you to come and empower you on the issue of maybe how to identify gifts or talents, or maybe something to do with special need, how to, to, to identify red flags, so that if your child is autistic, the parent can start looking at the milestones which the child is not getting right, and start seeking intervention as early as it can be. So those are the, the, those are the conversation schools are having with parents, but it is going to take time. It is going to take time. I'm almost crying. Oh, oh my gosh, you're giving me so much hope. So I should stop following these people on Twitter who are against CBC, right? No, you see, if you understand CBC, if you understand CBC, it is a very beautiful curriculum because I, 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 I remember the guy who is putting, uh, he is Nino and Karen. I can't remember his name. But I know it, it oh, sire, sire. Yes, sire. When, mm. when, he, when he was he was talking, he was talking about what, what he experienced. CBC wants to end that because CBC first there's no they, we are not grading, we are not giving children grades, we are not giving children marks. So if a child sits for an assessment, the child is allowed to do that assessment even for four days. So if today the child does number one to five and it is up to number one, up to 20, and another child does number one to 20, the one who has done one up to five, they are supposed to be given time until the day they will finish that assessment. But, so but, once the assessment is done, we are not giving grades or uh, runs or, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, marks. We'll tell the parent, your child has met expectation or your child has exceeded our expectation or your child is below expectation. And these are the interventions we are going to put upon this child so that we can help the child move from this to that. So it's a beautiful curriculum. It's only that some of, our, some of us educators have not gotten it. Some of us have gotten it. So it, is, it, it will take time until a time where everybody understands it and then parents, because they are not used to be called to school. You see, the, the reason why we are calling you to school, it is to build capacity on maybe a project the children are, are supposed to go and do. We are, you are not used to that. You only come to school to collect report form or to just to complain about grades or when your child is suspended or ex expelled or when your child is not behaving the way we, we, we want the child to behave, the way we want the child to behave, not the way the child is wired. So it is something which will take time. But if you ask me, because I have gone through it for four, I was in the elder system. And I have children, I, I have my own children who are going through CBC. I will tell you, and I have children, my own children who have gone through it for four, I will, and others international curriculum. I will tell you CBC is beautiful. It is beautiful. It is catering for everything we are, we, we, we are all talking about here. And it will see in the next five, 10 years, you know, when something is new, there's always resistance to change because we are, we are used to doing things this way. So it is normal for people to resist it. But there are so many, there are so many issues which are surrounding CBC, and that is why you are finding there's a lot of resistance. But if people understand it, if capacity building can continue so that parents can actually understand that look, this is, because parents are used to grades. So I'm giving you a child a progress report, which is like five pages or six pages to bring home. Then you are reading it. And then you are not seeing marks. You are not seeing grades. You understand? Definitely you as a parent will wonder what is happening to this curriculum Mako has brought to us. And that is the conversation which now the schools need to build capacity and explain to, to train, actually train parents what is CBC, how do we assess in CBC? It is more on competence, it is more on formative assessment, not summative. And that is a conversation which is already going on. And I'm very sure in the next five years, we'll catch up and we'll be able to say, wow, this is a very good curriculum. But still, 
trauma, whether CBC, whether 844, whether international curriculum, trauma is always there in schools. And one person said that, how do we mitigate it? I love the way Jackie was breaking it down, the way schools do it. In her school, Amma, the school she has interacted with, what they do and how they help this child to go through trauma. Because it can be a stress, a stress trauma like a child is going at home, there's divorce, or a child is coming from an a parent, I mean, a home where the parent is addicted either to drugs or alcohol, and the child is seen a lot. So you don't expect that child to come to school and sit and listen to the teacher. And the way she's saying, the way you receive that child. So maybe when the teacher just hugs the child or just smiles to the child, you have met that child day because she's coming from a very toxic environment. So it, it, it's something which really needs to be catered for. And uh, at times you find that like the way the young man was, 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 was narrating, it could be that the parents also had their own trauma and they were like, we don't want you to end up like us because we got where we are through education or we are not where we are because we never got good grades. So it might be an experience from the parents' background which pushes a child to perform. And most of us, that is what we went through because our parents went through a very uh, harsh reality of uh, 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 degrees are the, are the key to life. But that is not being overruled. You don't need a degree to make it. Okay. For the young man, uh, part of the trauma um, Saya went through is because the first three siblings had done well in school. So the, the, the problem of, uh, of, go of kids going to one school and going through the same lot of teachers is the comparison. So he, he was unfairly being compared to our older sister, I'm going to skip myself and my uh, uh, the, the brother who's before him. And that's, it's something we can, um, we can, we need to address. But I just love that we are going to capacity build parents. Joanne, your hand was up for forever. Do you want to, to and, talk? And, and before, jo jo if, before Joanne respond, remember that if your parents went through a, a training on capacity building on multiple intelligences, you will be having a very different conversation in that home. I'm just adding that. Okay. <laughs> because they will treat each and every child the, in a different way. That this one is not an air child. Maybe the intelligence is not logical. This one is like this, just to add on that. Yeah. OK. Joanne, your hand was forever. I, I, I'm so sorry. Nime <laughs> Shukisha, go ahead. No, no worries, no worries. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to piggyback on what Dr. Olive was saying. I'm not familiar with the C C CBC uh, system, but you were asking what else can be done to uh, mitigate trauma. I think one of the biggest things across the board, regardless of which education system uh, a child is going through is emotional intelligence. Uh, when adults are dysregulated, I don't care what kind of environment you foster, the children are going to be dysregulated and mistreated. So if the adults at home are dysregulated, they don't know how they're feeling, why they're feeling, what they're feeling, and their needs are not being met or they're not able to meet their own needs, the children's needs are not going to be met and therefore the children are going to bear the brunt of these dysregulated adults. So at whatever capacity, whatever systems and uh, processes are being implemented in the education systems or the uh, community systems or the religious systems, emotional intelligence has to be part of it. Otherwise, uh, without it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And, 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 and more importantly, creating systems that support families. And when I say families, I mean all types of families, whether it is a single parent home, whether it's a divorced home, whether it is a home where children are being raised by grandparents, whatever the home system looks like for that child, 
if that home is not being supported in the way it needs to be supported, then all these other systems that are being created will not make a, will not make a difference as such, will not create the impact they're being created for. So um, supporting single parents, supporting single mothers, supporting uh, communities that are poverty stricken, uh, support and, and and also remembering that the teachers who are in this educational system are those same very traumatized adults that are in your community. They are the drunken people you see in the streets. They are the ones who are cutting you off on the road and and throwing things at you. They are the same people who are the abusers at home, beating their wives and beating their children we need to remember that the teachers are also human beings who need their needs, their basic needs met before they can take care of your children in the education system. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, I think Dave, those are David, I think he dropped off, but yeah. Also, I have uh, a question. Oh, okay, Sarah, so go ahead. Um, th thanks guys, I'm listening. I have two very specific questions. So question number one is, um, in, in the fear of trauma, we've, we've ended up coming up with um, kiddie gloves, yeah, or the fear for kiddie gloves, the things which um, still don't make sense to me. Um, for instance, we, we run during a sports day and we give every kid who ran a medal when one finished 15 minutes after the other, and then we tell them, all of you are winners and really um, the Olympics does not work that way. You know, so we've ended up creating a system that for me is a bit disjointed and we say that that is protecting against trauma or um, the kids who are just Watundu, you know, they're just definitely Watundu and um, depending with which religious perspective you take, um, when do we know that we are how do we draw? So the first question is based on those examples. There could be many more. How do we draw the difference between a this is school-based trauma and a this is just a kid who needs a bit tougher love? That's question number one, you know. And question number two, I'll steal this from Aswani because we were having the discussion. It's a it's a it's a term um, I, I suspect she created, but it's called um, trauma porn. Um, where when we, I have a different name for it, but trust my medical sister to come up with medical terms, where we regurgitate by us relieving our, our trauma. And you, and you realize like this particular discussion, we steered away from sharing um, ugly details, relieving the past, saying how you're made to dance with a tree or mop the grass or you bullied one way or the other. It's, 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 it's just to try and avoid that, or that thing called trauma porn where we come together from this pity party, um, share our trauma experiences, cry over it, put it back, and we keep doing that. And I, I, I don't know, I would like to leave that second question a bit more open. Like, is trauma porn like a thing? And how do we, is it a thing? How do we overcome it? And does it have any therapeutic? Maybe we are, we are suppressing something that it should be, um, use a certain way to bring out um, therapy. So to repeat my questions, because they usually come with context, is one is a question of trauma porn. Um, how do we, does it have, does it serve any good? And if so, how can it be used? That if it's evil or bad, how do we deal with it? And then the first question was um, the question of where do we draw the line? Where do we, how do we know that this kid just needs tough love and that's not trauma to them? Um, how do we recreate our experiences so that they are more realistic and they don't kiddy glove the kids around? Those are my two questions. And I just want to add uh, on the trauma porn. I'm so sure I didn't come. I must have read it somewhere, but knowing me who grammatizes everything, mm -hmm. I could have come up with it. Um, you know, you know them. They're on Reddit, they're on Facebook, Nifichi ID, and people write all sorts of things that they've gone through, whether in marriage, and it's repeated all over, over and over on our Facebook pages, our WhatsApp groups. And I never see a solution. You feel like, and there's someone 
if you know if you're in Kenya, you know them. They have a YouTube channel, and they're ju they're just relieving all this stuff. Like, like it's glorifying trauma, and we are marinating in it. And I have a problem, and that's why I didn't ask for people to share what you went through because I I I I, I do not believe in the trauma porn. But um, someone needs to answer the question. So to relieve David, uh, so that da David Murathe can lower his hand. Um, as you think about Sia's questions, um, 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 Morathe, can you just ask your question or comment? Say what, Mr. Morathe? Is David Morathe on the call? I know. Yeah, is, is it a, is it a David Morathe? Are you the politician? <laughs> okay, David, just speak um, up. No. Okay, go ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, no, no, I'm not. I'm not the David Morathe that is in politics. But anyway. Um, I had just the same uh, question as the gentleman that spoke be before me. He asked, "What? Where do we draw the line?" So I, I also had the same concern. So if if we have this similar CBC con concept where you're having people doing exam for four days, where do you get to the point where they that um, we encourage that competitiveness? You know, when it comes to um, the real. Uh, world maybe business and all because that competitiveness is also is also important and then for my next question um because we're looking at these kids who are coming up from the cbc um who are who are a bit younger well and mostly the point where we're having a lot of issues is people who are in high school they are teenagers and all where do we get to that um how do we help this these ones who are a bit older maybe in 13 years and to the 18 years, that's the point where I think we lose a lot of um, the kids. Yeah, so so those are my two questions. Um, yeah. Okay, um, the panel is, it's free for all. I do not know anyone who wants to take a stab at Sires and, and, and David's questions. Uh, I think I can for... Okay. Definitely the trauma porn thing. Um, there is definitely, and it, it's, it's been obser observed a lot that we are very overly obsessed with repeating the same narrative over and over again. But the worst part is that we don't have a solution. There is, but I loved this platform is that Jackie gave us solutions. Patricia gave us solutions. There are actual things that are happening. Even Dr. Olive also gave solutions there needs to be a solution to all these stories that people are sharing because there is a cathartic effect of saying what has happened to you. That is really important, sharing your story, yeah? Maybe not with the whole world, but with somebody who can help you process through the whole experience, that helps. But beyond that, there needs to be a plan of how this happened, what do we do about it? Because like we say, the brain is very malleable. It's neuroplasticity is our friend. We can always change the way we think. We can adjust, even from our experiences, we don't have to be subject to what happened to us for the rest of our lives. And also there should be that limitation that even for this coming generation, that they don't have to use this trauma word as an excuse for why they're not doing their level best in life where you know, you're like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't tell me something, are you traumatizing me? And that becomes a, you know, a, a crutch all the time. We're holding on to that and we're avoiding responsibility. And then now that will bring another whole set of new ACEs. So a really important thing when we came to the basic needs that children need, there were two things that I felt were very important. We talked about regulation, emotional regulation and one thing that's really important and all children should be shown is that that should be mirrored. It should be shown. There should be the adults in the children's lives should be able to model that type of behavior. I should model how I process my negative and my positive emotions. I should be able to pass it along, even as a teacher, as a caregiver, I should be able to do that. So that is very important. And the second thing is discipline. Discipline is also a basic need. It's not, we, we, the way we, we are, we are very animalistic. We said, 
there's that larger portion of when we're children, the, the larger portion that's developed is the reptilian and then the mammalian. So it's very, it's not cognitive. So if we don't learn how to, Im, how to impart a lot more use of the upper brain, then we go wrong. So there needs to be action repercussion. That should never be negated just because we're talking about trauma-based experiences and trauma-informed spaces. Discipline is also very important. Discipline and also modeling of the behavior that we want to show, because we can't be uh, dysregulated like Joanne said, and then at the same time expecting children to be regulated. So that is also very important. So those two things, so that we don't start leaning to this as some excuse as to why we are not behaving in the best way possible. Okay, Jackie, I, I saw your fib uh, a feeble hand raised. Why, was it a complete one? Was it a bonus? If, uh, were you raising your hand? <laughs> it was a complete one. Um, you'll forgive me. I have. I'm surrounded by kids here. It's okay. And it's their, it's their play time. Um, I think I'd, the the question Sire asked about organizing sports days and awarding everybody so that we don't upset others. I think it's a discussion that is going on um, around schools, especially these schools uh, where parents pay school fees. And, and through uh, kindergarten graduation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'll sum it up as award, 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 award giving ceremonies. There's, there's, a, there's a question. The real world out here is very different from the life that we are all trying to give our kids in school. The real world is, is very harsh. Uh, it's also very competitive. But what we are facing, we are, we are increasingly facing is a situation where no, 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 no. Let them learn at their pace, let them do things at their pace. Then what that creates is, it creates, you know, there's no resilience. And in life, surely if you're not resilient, if you're not adaptable, then you're going to have problems as you develop. I remember last week on Saturday, there was this um, very well written article about the lost generation. I can't remember whether it was the nation or the, the standard. And I picked two cases where these 20, four, five-year-old said that, you know, she could not bear rejection, uh, so she'd rather not apply for a job, something along those lines. Uh, she's okay because she's getting an allowance, she spends time surfing Netflix, because her mother made sure that her success in primary, kindergarten, primary, all the way to university was very well uh, taken care of. So someone else took care of her success. So my interpretation is that she was always made, made to feel very successful. So there was no push. If she didn't do very well, she may have gotten the most improved award, etc. Then there was a young man also who faced something similar and now was back home because he didn't work out at the place of work. It was a bit too difficult. He's got three kids there. Mommy has hired a nanny who's taking care of the kids because two of them were taken there and dumped by the mothers, okay? Then the question I ask is when, if we go back to their childhood and the processes along their development, were they treated with kid gloves, like Sire said, to an extent that they, they failed to develop as well as they should develop? When we have sports days, when we have swimming galas, or these, when we award academic excellence, I totally understand that sometimes it's unnecessary to come up with all these little, little awards because we want to please. What I believe as educators, as adults, as parents, and I believe Rahedi, Rahedi so forgive me if I don't get your name right, has said is, it starts with the adults and it starts with the awareness we create. Because the truth is, you're going to encounter obstacles. You're going to encounter someone who's better than you at something. I'd like to relate this to the multiple intelligences. What if schools and parents and other stakeholders really got involved in understanding all these differences in us, now that we know, now that it's no longer about the logical mathematical intelligence, and said, not all of us are musicians. So somebody's going to have a better voice than you. Not all of us are using bolts. 
you know, somebody is gonna run faster than you. Not all of us, uh, Michelangelo. Somebody is gonna be a better artist than you. So why don't you focus on what you can do really well, and uh, also bring these other things that you may not be very excellent at along, because that's what makes you the person that you are. So that as uh, as schools and as families, we are raising people who know that I may not have won in this particular one, but I know that there's something that I'm really great at. So. It's a combination of the adults in the children's lives where parents don't get disappointed when their children didn't get an award and work so hard going to see the school head teachers, the, the teachers and asking why this one mark should have been added or oh, how come he was placed in this group, that group is, you know, all the things that teachers uh, go through. So in summary, it's the adults first of all, it has to start with we the adults and how we communicate what these events are about. It is we, the adults, to look back into ourselves and ask why we do things the way we do, bring on board the parents, educate them, empower them. This also brings me to what Dr. Olive said uh, about empowering the parents. It's something that I believe in and it's something that is really powerful. But I also wonder whether we will get to a, a point where the parents become more powerful than the teachers because the teachers have not been equipped. So. Then I go back to the government and ask, what are you doing in teacher training institutions? What, what are some of the modules that need to come on board so that teachers that are released to the world, to the marketplace, are well equipped to manage the emerging child, the emerging parent, and we all know the challenges of the middle class, and, um, and, and all these issues that we are talking about, so that we don't traumatize kids and we don't also get traumatized as others because we are we are dealing with issues of accountability we are dealing with issues of trying to raise children to develop the dispositions that will enable them to fit into the into the realities of the world i think that's how to answer the first question the second question uh, uh, somebody answered it very well i think thanks and i think that answers your question anyango um so the, the the reason why your 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 school is to, still doing positions is they they need to to change how they are doing stuff. They need to be reparented, and the teachers need to be retaught how to do CBC in the uh, uh, the way Dr. Olive has laid out the plan. So it needs a collective group group. It it needs collective group work to undo what's being done. So the parents need to stop doing the whole 844, we were number one and we went to Alliance and Loreto. And the, the, the uh, teachers need to stop pegging their, 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 their performances. Like we had the most A's in this school and all that nonsense that goes on. Joanne, um, your hand was up and then we'll go to, I like Kosterian name, Marumba, my gosh. <laughs> Lu Lu yes, where were you when people were choosing names? Okay, um, Joanne, go ahead. Um, I'm going to answer the kitty glove uh, question um, from a perspective of personal responsibility in terms of parents, right? So we are more and more um, experiencing where parents, uh, I work as a HR practitioner outside of being a coach. So we find these same parents who want their kids to be number, who, to, who want their kids to be given trophies in, in school coming to the workplace and also saying their kid needs to be in certain positions. So there is a, an element that is lacking in adults. And, and I keep saying this, kids are not the problem. Adults are the problem. In every structure you look at, adults are the problem. So parents have decided that this child is what gives them what as a human being. And if this child does not meet a certain uh, class, a certain level, a certain whatever it is this parent has made up in their head. You know, a lot of, you'll hear a lot of parents saying in a joking manner that this is my mini me. Okay. When you say this is my mini me, um, most of us look at it as this child looks like me. 
but a lot of times it's internalized that this child is me. Therefore, this child has to meet all the things that I have created in my head that they need to meet. And they also have to uh, live up to my unmet dreams, whatever it is I wanted to be as a, as a child that I never got to be. I'm now imposing on the child. And therefore, if you are not good at sports, even when you know very well your child is not good at sports, you want them to be number one in sports. You want them to sing. You want them to do ballet. And this is why we are also overextending children and putting them in a gazillion different activities and exhausting them because we want them to be our social status, my child does, my child has accomplished, my child has done. So that personal responsibility and accountability from an adult perspective is lacking. And then also structure, what structures are we creating for these children? And um, in terms of competition, like in the schools, uh, especially in sports and music and drama and those things that are the arts that are um, healthy for every child because creativity is part of a child's, it's, it's, it's a very important aspect of a child's growth. There is, what is missing is um, mastery versus control. Are we trying to control whatever the system is by saying every child must win versus there is mastery that has to be met for you to be the gold Olympic winner versus the bronze Olympic winner or just to be a qualifier, but then you don't make it to the top, right? And accepting that, yes, I may be good at this, but there will always be somebody who is better. There'll always be somebody who is taller. There'll always be somebody who is shorter. There'll always be somebody who is better in English and another one who is better in math. So creating environments from the home and the school that not only foster that healthy competition, but also foster understanding that there is always somebody who's going to do better than you. And that doesn't mean that you finishing the race last means you are unworthy or invaluable. The fact is you tried and you actually finished the race. There's nobody else. There's, there are those who did not even attempt, right? Like when you look at marathoners, there's that person who runs and runs for 10 hours versus Kipchoge who runs for 59 minutes, the same marathon, right? So just acknowledging that the effort is there, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get a prize, but acknowledging that you actually tried. So that's what I wanted to add on to there. And off to Marumba, I think you next. Yeah, Marumba, and then Carol, I have seen your hand. Uh, Marumba, go ahead. All right, uh, Hamjambo. Jambo. Very good. Okay. I'm Morumba Morvita. I want to just give a little background and then I'll, I'll share my comments. I am a graduate of Kenyatta University. I worked in Kenya. I was a high school teacher and then principal at Nyeri Baptist High School those days. And then came back to the U.S. where I got my PhD and I'm working at the at the university where we prepare educators to go and teach. But at the same time, I've been back and forth to Kenya to work with certain institutions like Moore University and uh, Strathmore, and also engaging with people just to try and, and support the efforts that are going on in, in terms of education. Um, one based on the question and the comments that were shared here. First of all, this for uh, Portia and the team, this is wonderful. I wish we had those even at KU. I know I took guidance and counseling class. Yes, the little that I learned, I tried to implement, but it's, it's pretty uh, uh, daunting task, uh, especially when uh, someone said we have a lot of uh, students in school with all that they bring into the school. 
And then with the challenges that the teachers want to, are, are facing, especially in making their, their lives because they want to be like everybody else and uh, they're working hard, but then at the same time, they feel like, oh, I don't want to spend extra energy and time to work with students. So having said that, the issue of this uh, competition awareness, and I agree with the professionals in this area that have spoken, I think one person that is left out is sometimes is engaging the students. And I'll bring this to my, 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 my uh, experiences. When I was a high school principal and a teacher there, I spent time to, talk, to listen to the students which was unheard of because principal, you don't go and teach, you don't even listen to students. But students are very, and young people, they're, they're self-aware as Joanna said, they're very realistic. In these sports activities, in the content areas, you ask them, who is good at soccer? They'll tell you that one is a better midfielder than me. They know, they know exactly what they have, but then, as we have seen is that the issue is us parents trying to project something that we were unable to do maybe years ago, or we want them to be at a certain place. And that creates a false perception of ability for these kids who have been babied and carried and not told the truth, not in a negative way, but in a way that someone uh, stated very well, if we understand the point of entry of a student, not only in the content areas, but in their own abilities, it helps. And then when we set realistic goals, like, okay, today you ran this mile and it took you 40 minutes. What can you do to shave it? So it becomes an individualized performance. And then for the competitions who are going to represent us in the school, if they're the top ones, we celebrate together and enjoy that. If we create, if schools, parents, I know it's, 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 a, it's a talk, but I think we have to start with the, with the spaces that we are in and model that. And I remember by doing that, there were quite a number of, of the students who were labeled as they will never make it in life, but because of that conversation and engagement, and the model behavior, these are people who are doing extremely well, extremely well. Some of the personalities, I just, I just marvel to see some personalities in, in Kenya who, who are my students who are doing very well. And it, it's just encouraging because it was realistically conveyed to them. And then they understood what the stakes are the, what they are able to do and, uh, and therefore were successful. So, so that's my comment, but I really, really appreciate this uh, conversation. Karibu uh, sana. Asante. Carol, go ahead. And, um, and if someone could just comment on, you know, the implicit biases and in our own setting, that, that would be, I know we call out um, what is it called racism, but we have our own elephants and, and that's um, colorism and, uh, and, and tribalism, which are huge. Um, in, and, and also the, the, the social economic status. I don't, if someone can just throw in that comment in as we go along, that would be nice. Carol, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Posa. Um, <clears throat> I can't put on my video. I'm not in a place where I'm able to do that. But I also came in late. So I hope that whatever I say will not be a repeat of what uh, someone else said earlier. But I just thought I would chime in just listening to the comments, especially when it comes to just thinking about how we need to empower parents, uh, describing how parents parents go to school and uh, start demanding why is my child not having not having a trophy or why is my child not um, not not getting the marks they're supposed to get there's there's that parents attacking teachers so much and one of the things that I have 
realized is that it's it still just comes from their own unmet and unfinished business from school and they are trying to finish their business through their children and we can sit here and describe everything that parents are doing um, negative which all comes from somewhere and a lot of us have evidence for it however what i have really also realized when i work one-on-one -on -one at a very close level with parents is that I'll, they do a lot of this from a lack of awareness just a total lack of self-awareness uh, and, and and just then supporting parents to begin to be more self-aware for me is one of the best gifts that we can give parents to just be aware that um, I'm also carrying my own trauma. I'm also carrying my own uh, issues from the past and finished business. And this is why I'm showing up the way I am. Um, I, I, having worked with parents, I see a lot of them really just want to do the right thing for their children. They just do not have, number one, the self-awareness, and number two, the skills to do the things they need to do. And therefore, uh, for me, it's just a call. I mean, wherever we are in our spaces, whatever information that we have uh, as experts here and as practitioners, let's let's share this information there's just a light bulb moment parents get when they realize oh i'm the one who is in the way oh my gosh i didn't know that and once they are over that initial guilt of you mean it's my baggage that i have been bringing into this space they are really open and willing because there is no parent who does not want the best for their child. Um, and so if we in our different spaces, we could be able to do that, then you know, uh, we would make a, a difference in those little small spaces. Uh, the other thing that um, that was brought up is this trophy sizing everything, you know, every child gets a trophy. And, and that's not surprising. The reason it's not surprising is because just the progression of human behavior is that we just tend to come from one extreme to the other. And then now we find our pendulum. We go through, we swing from one end to the other and then we get our, our balance. And so I am actually not too concerned about that because I can see that we are getting our balance. We are coming from a place where there, is so, there was so much information about how much um, childhood trauma affects adults. And so parents can have come into parenting with wearing kid gloves, you know, with being very overly careful. And so then that's why we're having all these examples. And I don't know the name of the lady because I was, I, I didn't get her, I just found her talking about that um, article on, on standard or nation. Clearly, that's a parent who most likely went through something, is likely to have gone through something, and so they went to the other extreme. And they were like, my child will not go through this. And I'm going to create the pathway and make sure I helicopter my child and I become a lone more parent where you just clear the pathway for your child so that they don't have to experience any obstacles. Uh, so that's one extreme. And if a parent is able to just be made to understand that's where they are coming from, if that's where they are coming from, then give them the tools to get now to the other uh, side. So what has happened is we're coming from that extreme of trauma. Then we come to this other extreme of um, of not really of, of of being too easy, too easy on on our children. But what I'm also seeing is that we are actually beginning to find balance also in between. Well, uh, uh, now a lot of the institutions, you know, where you pay fees that were atrophizing everything, are beginning to shift into the growth mindset uh, space where you are encouraging your child to using words that have to do with process and not just end product. So we are motivated, uh, a lot of schools and, and parents are also adopting that the growth mindset space where you are, um, you look more at the process. So we, we teach our children not to just go for the end results, not just go for the trophy. And again, those spaces are opening up a little, little by little. And, and, and I think that um, we need to, even as we are discussing this, let's also embrace the, the, the fact that it's, there's a hopeful space and things are happening even in small, uh, small spaces. And also, you know, this, this conversation is one of them, just a place of bringing awareness so that people know that um, it's not all doom and gloom. Thank you.
and 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 some 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 small things that you can do you know like the way dr olive said um we don't have to take joan to ebushibungo to talk to my people it's just facilitating chai as in just send your mother ten dollars a thousand kenya shillings and they'll buy um uh, sukari and 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 milk and people will sit under a tree and just talk about these things in um in the local dialect and just get it it, it it's the small small things that we do that will make a big change we need uh, it will take time as um dr olive said it's gonna take five ten years but we will get there let's not give up hope to end the um one question yeah. has still not been answered which question? I thought we answered all your questions. Okay, which one? Murad's mm. question is actually still unanswered. Which the one? Question, the question of how do we get to the point of making sure that people don't use trauma as a crutch? As a crutch. As okay. A crutch. Yes, that needs to be answered. Okay. Um, um, Joanne, I know this is your, your, your special, you like this stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> How how do we uh oh, Trish should be wait Trish has been quiet for yeah, a while. Trish hasn't said anything. Do you want to say something, Trish, about that? That one is a tricky one for me because yeah, you know, I, I I'm not a counselor, I'm not, you know, I'm not a therapist, but I'll think that at some point you take ownership, you seek the help that you need to seek, and it's not gonna be, you know. Therapy can be lifelong, you know, and sometimes it should be because you go through life and, and you need to speak to somebody. But in terms of a particular issue, if you're receiving help, you need to do the work and failure to do the work and hold on to the crutch does not help you. And if you're honestly seeking help, you will be able to reach that point where you see that, okay, my behavior has to change for, for things to change for, for the better for me. So I think it's, it's just a personal responsibility and um, one's ability to be honest to the situation and, and just, you know, do what they need to do in order to progress um, with the help that they're getting. So I, I, that one is a tough one for me to answer. Okay. So yeah, I'm going yeah, to piggyback yeah. on her, on what she said, and, I, and that's exactly what I was going to say. It, 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 it gets to a point where as an adult, you have to take personal responsibility. Um, yes, your parents did, did whatever they did, your teachers did whatever they did, your, your church did whatever it did to disable you in certain areas. And the reason why you are where you are is because of maybe the decisions that you made or the decisions that were made for you as you were growing up. But as an adult, if you're showing up as that passive aggressive or just aggressive human being who is destructive in every space you go to and people are either directly telling you or avoiding you, it's time to take an internal, um, what is it called? Like you have to look in internally, you have to look inward and see how am I contributing to this mess that keeps following me everywhere I go. And when, when, when everything cannot be attached to trauma, everything cannot be attached to trauma. We also have to acknowledge that there are some people who have just grown up in environments where they were allowed to do anything and everything and therefore just became a menace to society. And they have to take personal responsibility. Sometimes that's why we have people in jail, right? Because a child was allowed to do certain things and then there were no guardrails because a child needs guardrails. And as they grow, the guardrails get wider, right? But if you were never given structure, there were never boundaries in the environment you grew up in, uh, then you become this person who doesn't take personal responsibility for your behavior and for what you're creating in your environment. So I think at the end of the day, it gets to a point where community, family, school systems work 
uh, the consequences, the natural consequences that come, that show up based on your behavior are an indicator that you need to take personal responsibility. Okay. And um, because Kenyans need to eat, right? Um, we need to like do the last um, bit. I just want us to, so if you've recognized you're traumatized, um, what, what's the next step? And is there anything, is there a positive outcome of trauma? Let me give you an example. Um, on the clinical side, uh, someone who has traveled both sides, um, part, partly because of poverty medicine and partly because of, of the trauma we went through as Kenyans, we are very good at picking clinical signs. Like I, um, when I hang out with my, my colleagues here, sometimes they're like, how did you know that person has a facial palsy? I'm, I'm like, I could see it. They couldn't see it. And it's that, you know, the way teacher Wanji could say to make a rada, you, your, that internalized trauma, the one for your, you're always on the, and your butt clenching everywhere. You're able to use that piece of trauma to, to pick out clinical signs that something is off. I'm just wondering, is there a positive side of trauma? And if you are traumatized or you've just um, discovered you're traumatizing someone, what's, what, what are the next steps? Let's just um, wind it down and you can ask your fellow panelists a question. I know it's loaded, but let's do this. Then we, what to Akule? Mukimba, because your face is on my screen, go ahead. Uh, plus also because I actually I wanted to ask the other therapist in the and the coach right I feel like a lot of us who get into the whole therapy business psychology counseling coaching all have a very interesting story behind it and that's that's you know trying to turn your pain into something passionate something you're passionate about and I think that really helps with the healing process is most of the times when we when we're trying to help from a place of heart from a place of knowing how it actually feels maybe to have gone through those aces to have gone through a traumatic upbringing it brings us to a place of power so that's a hopeful place to come from that because most of us have really painful stories we've made that conscious choice we've like you said the hyper vigilance allows us to also even be able to tell the signs in the children in our care because automatically we know we know this thing because we've seen it, it's familiar. So yeah, I, I don't know if it's a common narrative, but for me personally, mine is a pain to passion project that had to come from a, quite a few of, you know, a few problems back in my upbringing. And that's why I chose counseling. That's why I chose psychology as, you know, my avenue to try and help other people. Who wants to go next? Oh, Jackie, I, the hand is firm now. Very good. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> You're mute. Okay. You need to unmute yourself, yeah. Before I echo what uh, Mukimba has said, there's a gentleman who, who spoke about students. And I believe uh, it's, it, it's what we call the student voice, having uh, making sure that you you take the student voice in the schools very seriously, and when this happens, sometimes they become the best ambassadors to the parents. So by the time you're bringing the parents on board, their children have already started the process of uh, re getting them to unlearn some of their practices and uh, and beliefs. The other lady, I believe it's Caroline, spoke about the helicopter lawnmower parents. We, we totally understand them, and I, I believe that's why we've, um, most schools, again, I'm talking about my colleagues, friends in the profession who come up with the strategies of getting them together and showing them that they are probably doing more harm than good. Uh, and they, when they get to pull off and uh, reflect, they actually realize that they would be of greater help to their children if they work with the school. The, the same lady spoke about research not research, um, uh, focusing on the process rather than the outcome. And I think that's why it's very important for schools to have a curriculum or programs that encourage students to do either projects or research because you have to go through the process of 
collecting, but you know, thinking, planning, collecting the material or the data that you need before you finally get to the final product. The kids may not realize it then, but in the end, when you're doing the final presentation and you're talking about it, they realize that along the way they've developed all these dispositions of uh, resilience, um, adaptation, ad adaptability, communication, etc., etc. And obviously, also taking responsibility for their own learning because then when you insist that they have to do it and mommy or daddy doesn't have to hire somebody or help them they they thrive in their achievement and from there they actually grow their wings uh, finally is there a positive uh, in trauma yes uh, i probably i i live through very difficult math classes it didn't help um, that the teacher made it very clear uh, to me and to a few others in the same category that we would amount to nothing. I wish he was here listening to <laughs> tonight. And as a result of that, I'm very passionate about how teachers teach the subject in school and how teachers support the children understand mathematics and see math as a part of life that we have to navigate and come up with strategies that are friendly to the learning of uh, mathematics as a subject. I think some of my colleagues who are on Zoom, uh, on Zoom can, can attest to, to that, my passion to that. In addition, because of some of the practices we experienced in school like, you know, neglect and um, uh, favoritism and, uh, you know, being treated in a certain way because maybe you, you look like you could not afford you didn't have nice dresses, you could not bring the teacher a gift. As a result of that, I believe I'm a better teacher and I'm more sensitive to the needs of the, the children and I wouldn't want any child to be treated in the way that I was, I was treated. So I think those are some of the positives that came out of that. And there was an issue, the issue about uh, a crutch. Uh, I read a book called uh, um, Talk It Out by Dr. Barbara Somebody and it's about how to deal with conflict, especially in the workplace, in the education world, but I think it's applicable across the board. One of the things that I picked was when you see people playing victim or villain, they're actually relieving some of the experiences that, th that they've had. And uh, sometimes you've got to show tough love and give them that wake up call that, look, you're not going to keep saying that your father did this. You're you're an adult. So if we can deal with the adults that way, then I think we need to transfer the same processes as we are dealing with kids, but obviously in a more delicate way, and bring them to a level where they take responsibility for their learning, for their growth, for their behavior, as well as heal along the way. Thank you. Okay, who wants to go next? Joanne, go ahead. So the question was, is there a positive to trauma? Um, I'll say yes and no. Obviously no, because w nobody wants to go through trauma, really. Like it shouldn't be a thing. We should, we should work on ways to eradicate it, right? But in the world we live in, um, there's absolutely no way to er eradicate it because we are dealing with humans and every generation comes with its own type of trauma that they pass on to the next generation. But uh, like Dr. Carol Chakua said in uh, the chat, there is post-traumatic wisdom. And I get to see it in my classes because um, when that trauma is identified, when that person, when a person get to that moment where they ha have their aha moment that this is the reason they behave the way they do, then they cannot um, act like they don't know anymore, right? They cannot act like they, this, is, this is information that they don't have. And that kind of forces them to start implementing changes, obviously with the right resources. So, Conversations like this create environments where maybe a person feels safe to talk about how what their struggles are and why they're struggling. And also gives those of us who are in these professions and who have access to this information to share it and give step-by-step, step-by-step um, step uh, uh, action items, I guess, to, to, to help people 
uh, address their traumas. Now, again, Carol Chakua had said earlier on, create spaces where information is being freely shared. So Posa, back to your community in, I can't even pronounce that every word, I even forgot you what it was. Yeah. Um, ground roots, uh, ground roots work. Those of us who have the ability, the capability and the willingness to take this work that we do and to take this knowledge to those places or give it to the people who can take it to those places. Uh, yes, we live in a capitalistic environment or in a capitalistic world where we all need to earn a living for to, to, to be comfortable and to meet our own basic needs. But do some pro bono work where you're empowering a person who can go empower another person so that this information can be changed. Because one changed person uh, is a whole family changed because they start showing up differently. If it's a mother, she will be a different parent. She will be a different community leader. She will be a different employee. If it's a father, the same thing. And therefore, those who encounter those people see a difference in those people and, and start wanting to change. So changing one person or empowering one person empowers a community. So let's, let's just consider doing some pro bono ground, ground roots work where we can empower people so that they can empower each other and empower the younger generations coming up. That's all I needed to say. Thank you. Thank you. Trish, do you want to go? Um, essentially, what everybody has said, I agree with. Um, at the end of the day, it's the outcome of, you know, managing your trauma that has its benefits, because now you learn that you're resilient. You've worked through this, you've come out on top and charting the way forward from there. So that's a positive thing. Um, and also in so doing, charting the way forward for others who are going through what you went through, it, it's a positive thing. But as um, Joanne had mentioned, it, it's kind of tricky to say that there's positivity in, in trauma because trauma in of itself is just, it's just not positive. It's not a positive thing. But the outcome of overcoming that trauma is, is what's positive and what should be encouraged. Just to let people know that seek the help, take accountability, handle the situation, and you know, you you won't have to live in that darkness anymore. You know, you you you'll be able to move forward. So that's the positivity in that, you know, being able to seek the help, take accountability and doing what you need to do. So that that's my take from that. Okay. I think we've covered everything. Kenyans need to eat, unless, does anyone have a burning question? If you have a question for the panelists, if you have a question for me, am I gonna say for me? Yeah, if you have a question for me, you can unmute and ask, raise your hand and ask a question. I, hi, uh, my name is Jockey. I have a, I have a statement to make. Uh, okay. th thank you for the opportunity. Um, whenever Joanne talked about uh, the grassroots, and what was it, Posa, what's the shark's name? Indigenous. You have to, let me put it in the... Ebishibungo, yes. Ebishibungo. Yeah, take, taking us back to Ebishibungo. <laughs> Actually, you guys, what we're, I, what we're going to realize here pretty soon is that we really... We are, uh, the systems that we are talking on, about are not novel. They are not necessarily new, right? Well, and I put something in the in the in the chat section. What we're going to learn is that pre-colonialism, pre-Christianity and Islam and all these uh, religions that have come to find us, is that the way our people lived, they had systems in place to take care of some of these realities we are talking about. Now, the context could have obviously been very, very different. But if you're going back to the grassroots, I think the approach should be one where you go first with open ears, right? Because that uh, Shosho and Vuka that uh, Olive uh, mentioned about that you're trying to bring into the system, if you're trying to tell them, no, you can only talk within the parameters of CBC, the new uh, education system, they're gonna be lost, right? 
But if you ask them, how did you guys do these things? And I know a lot of them have, are passing away. And that is information that needs to be captured and preserved is that if we re-indigenize ourselves, right, in our professions as a teacher, I'm a teacher myself, you know, as medical doctors, as whatever it is, if you first shut your mouth and listen twice, right, to those systems that existed, then your the the reception that you're going to get at Ebushibungo and my shags, which is Kiawagenya village, is going to be very different because you're contextualizing it. You're not bringing it in. Apana, this is not uh, seven six whatever whatever anymore or eight four four or CDC or or this is not this theory that theory. We want to your your uptake is going to be different because there's a contextualization that makes sense right to the people that you're you're trying to talk to. So that humility is important um, as much as it is that, yes, we can integrate new learning with old learning as well. And that is where I think the crux of the matter is in trying to absolutely mainstream these processes. We have to first understand that contextualization and indigenize whatever it is that we are teaching. Yes, uh, I have nothing to add there. Okay. Anyone uh, else? Jose, it's not a question, but it's always just a shout out and reminder um, that each of our panelists um, does run a, oh, yeah. This, yeah, they each run a gig. Um, they can always drop the links to their work and their practice um, on the chat. And we can also make sure we have it available on Facebook because um, I think value, we, we need to normalize, especially in the African setting, um, repaying value with value, because I think um, the time all of them have put here is valuable. So I think the return of value is to actively encourage people that, hey, if you want to discover your, rediscover your inner child, if you're a young adult who needs um, help with walking through a journey, if you're dealing with a child with special care need, each one of these individuals here is able to adequately do the same. So um, a shout out to each one of them and to also have them a drop the link to their practice. Um, the other guys can be able to engage with them beyond this. Okay, yes. What uh, were uh, Madukani? Drop your links uh, and Chakua, because you're always part of this um, forum. Please drop in any therapist here who's because we, um, if you if you can, if you have the means please pay for someone to go through therapy. If you if you can and you have the means, please pay for all the panelists, okay, except me, here to, to at least go to Ebushibungo and Kiangoma and Kiangai um, to, to, to deliver these talks and just talk to the Shoshos and the Gukas there and for them to um, uh, exchange knowledge. If you have the means, just um, help, help out there. And um, the, the flyer up there is, um, is 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 for in the next two weeks these adults these children who've been traumatized are gonna go to the workplace i know this timeline is like a is like a movie um and we are going to tackle the 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 story of workplace trauma and um so, some of the panel we i have the same repeat um panelists uh, who've been awesome, awesome. I don't pay them anything except my mother's prayers because they are stronger than mine. Just join us um, in, in two weeks. Um, the people in the States, we have to, our clock changes next week, so we, we would be confused. So we are doing it in, in two weeks, so join us. If you have a question, just um, ask, ask, we will try and help. Unless any, um, anyone has a burning question, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the um, the audience, and thank you to the non-panelists who, who also contributed. Mungu awabariki awongeze. Many days not in coma. Thank you. And um, sana asante. Thank you guys so much because um, the fact that you showed up here today means that you care about making a change in your community, in your home, in yourself, wherever it is. So we are grateful that you gave us an audience because we could be here talking to ourselves. So we don't take that for granted. Asante, I know. Yeah. And um, you can unmute and say Kwaheri and I will not end it unceremoniously. Thank you. We see you in two weeks, the same way you got this. I do not have a Facebook page. Myself, I do not have a WhatsApp group. I'm just weird. 
like that, but they all have. So just follow them. And the same way you got these things, you will get the one for in two weeks time. So this thanks. was awesome. Thank you. Thank Carrie you guys. Bustani. Thank you. I think Doreen has much. a question. I guess, or, Dor or Doreen wants to say something. We'll, we'll hang out here for a little bit. Uh, unmute yourself, Doreen. Doreen Bin Vicente. Doreen, you raised your hand by mistake. Maybe she raised her hand by mistake. I don't know. Okay, thank you, thank you. And you can, I know, um, if you have a question, just ask. Um, Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. That was uh, Merab. Do you have a question or a comment? Merab, unmute yourselves, guys, if you want to say something because you're yeah. on mute. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, my name is Merab. I'm a play therapist, also an infant uh, therapist, and uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. I came in at the tail end of the conversation. And I like the idea of going back to the difficult name that was said. Uh, because that's one, that's <laughs> one of the things that, I, that, I'm, that I'm trying to do because infant mental health is not something that is much talked about. And uh, it's exciting actually to go out. I live in a community uh, among the Maasai people and uh, I've been doing some work uh, with the infants in the community very interesting so thank you very much for even this conversation that you have just had i really appreciate it. thank you and it's gonna be on the on the on the authentic um okay i'm not gonna admit to people who are in the waiting room now it's it's uh, it's not going to work that way and it's gonna be on the facebook um page authentic dialogues by sire um so you can you can share um during Vicente or Vicente, do you want to make a comment? You can unmute yourself. Or the infant, Mer Merab, someone wants you to share your contacts. Please share them. Okay, all right. Share them on the, on the chat. Doreen, I think I'll leave to Salimia. And you, can, and you know what, you, um, the, the, the same, you can also post it on the Facebook uh, whatever where it's permanent because this one once i end this meeting it's gonna disappear so just yeah. share them on the on the same link thank you should i just end the watch okay thank you Posa. okay thank you thank you bye-bye have a good night yeah, okay bye. good night kenyans good night good night you good night